Good afternoon. We will be starting in two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> just, just about. Like, like talking to it, like, uh, I don't know. I'll be interested. I always have this problem. The podium. You might just have to take the mic. And I know. Yeah. Well, I can do it. I can sit down. Yeah. Too. Well, it's tough because you have your um, paper, you know, that you're. Right. So right. you take them, and then how how do you advance the slides when they? There is a clicker. There's right a clicker, here. so you know. Yeah. I've had to do this like various ways. Okay. I see people working your way back to your seats. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Welcome, my, good afternoon. My name is Michael Reeves. I work in the Office of Diversity Programs here on campus. Are you happy to be here? Yeah. Woo! It's the 13th annual, it's pretty exciting. So my job is to introduce the next panel. Um, this is panel number two, a film discussion on the black press soldiers without swords and in inter interception, sorry. This panel will discuss Stanley Nelson's award-winning documentary film, The Black Press Soldiers Without Swords and Interception, Jane Kennedy, American Sportscaster, a film by Sophia Songhai, Nelson, Nelson's film outlines the history of the U.S. black press from its founding in 1827, tracing its role in great migration, two world wars, and Songhai's short documentary highlights Jane Kennedy's rise from beauty queen to NFL sportcasters, the newspaper as a voice for unity and hope and alternative perspectives to mainstream media, and a powerful tool for promoting independent and critical thought among various African-American communities also will be discussed. Our moderator for today is Dr. Loretta Brady from St. Anselm College. She is not nervous and she will cut you off if you <laughs> are speaking too long. So at this time, Dr. Brady. Well, I don't know if it's entirely true that I'm not nervous. However, I'm very glad to be here and very excited for this panel. Um, each of our presenters will um, share their film. Each of them said that the film piece itself is about 15 minutes. Um, I want to provide an opportunity for uh, group questions, but I also want to provide an opportunity to um, see the conversation between these two pieces. Um, and perhaps identify some of those gaps that um, Dr. Thorne shared earlier. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce from the um, program, um, Dr. Kanzad and Ms. Songhai. Um, I'll read their bios and then we'll um, start with Dr. Kanzad's work. <clears throat> so Julia Kanzad is a professor of English 
Cinema Studies and Women's Studies at the University of New Hampshire. She's the author of Ethnic Modernisms um, by Paul Grave Macmillan in 2002 and Hollywood's Hawaii, Race, Nation, and War by Rutgers University Press in 2017. The first full-length study of the film industry's intense engagement with the Pacific region from 1898 to present. Her new book highlights films that mirror the cultural and political climate of the country over more than a century, from the era of US imperialism through Jim Crow racial segregation, the attack on Pearl Harbor in World War II, the civil rights movement, the contemporary articulation of consumer and leisure culture, as well as the buildup of the modern military industrial complex. Focusing on important cultural questions pertaining to race, nationhood, and war, the book offers a unique view of Hollywood film produced about the, nation, the national periphery for mainland U.S. audiences. Hollywood's Hawaii presents a history of cinema that examines Hawaii and the Pacific and its representations on film in the context of colonialism, war, orientalism, occupation, military buildup, and entertainment. Sophia Songhai is a film director, Emmy award-winning television producer, and broadcast journalist. A Philadelphia native, she trained with playwright Antozaki Shange, Sankofa director Haley Jarima, film director Spike Lee. Songhai's films Ladylike and In Silent Spaces both follow black female protagonists and explore themes of sisterhood, mother-child relationships, religion, spirituality, and the male gaze. Ladylike was incorporated into middle school curriculum to teach religious tolerance and interpretations of the feminine ideal. Songhai also has worked as a television commentator for CNN's Aaron Burnett out front, discussing topics concerning racial profiling, the George Zimmerman trial, police brutality, and the impact of the murder of Trayvon Martin. Since 2014, she has covered international news as a TV anchor reporter for Arise News and Peace News Network. Songhai is a summa cum laude graduate of Howard University and earned a master's degree at the Tisch School of the Arts at NYU <laughs> University. Please join me in welcoming both of these presenters and please Dr. Consent join me. Okay. So um, I'm here to discuss um, Stanley Nielsen's 1999 um, the Black Soldier, uh, the Black Press, Soldiers Without Swords. Um, it's an award-winning PBS documentary, and it follows the traditional aesthetics and style of the documentary genre using a narrator, um, the um, well-known film and stage actor Joe Morton. Um, it also features Talking Heads, um, the experts that come in, um, usually journalists and their family members, historians and scholars, um, and it makes good use of archival film footage, photos, songs, and music. Uh, Ron Carter, um, the well-known um, jazz bassist, um, composed a lot of it. Uh, where this film truly shines is in its subject matter and the information it delivers. It is one of the few films uh, that looks closely at the ba uh, black press, giving a historical overview from the time of its founding in 1829, uh, when Freedom's Journal was um, uh, started publishing, moving through the Civil War, Reconstruction, World War I, lynching, race um, riots, the Great Migration, World War II, and the Civil Rights Era, which ironically would spell the end of the black press. So what I wanna do is show you this film. Okay. Let me get this going. Sorry about this. Oh. I have some clips here. I'm streaming it from um, Canopy, from the UNH Canopy, and I hope it does well. Okay. So this is the beginning of the film. We were 
this is really nice how he introduces his film and then he puts all of the various uh, um, black press headlines on there. Okay, and I'm gonna pause it and I'm gonna skip over. Just bear with me. I can't read the it's so small. <laughs> I'm trying to read that. This is as close as I'm going to get it. You have a black woman by a Negro. It is the race question in the ugliest, um, vilest, most dangerous aspect. The Negro as a political factor can be controlled, but not a law. I wanted to show the part right after this. And here's the part about Ida B. Wells. This is Vernon Jarrett. And intended to destroy her property, take her life to the extent that she brought the truth. There was pressure under her brows or apron, or according to legend, two pistols on the table. Fearing for her life, Wells did not return south for 30 years. She continued her groundbreaking work on the staff of the New York Daily. She really set the Okay, and I'm going to move it now up. This is during the World War II era, where um, the Double V campaign and how the government. Looked upon, um, looked upon it as uh, seditious. It's the part right after this.
relevant. He didn't have the guts. This sells to a no. The word no. All he had to do, Dave Kahuna, say, what part of no don't you understand? Frank Bolden was uh, one of the earliest war correspondents. Frank Bolden, one of the first two African American war correspondents, was summoned to Washington from his post in Berlin. I just had a notice one day that, uh, that I was one of them who wanted to do the report on the disposition of the troops as regards this double E program that Hoover said was an act of sedition. I only stayed two days because when I found out it was superfluous and silly, I didn't want to waste my time. The longer I stayed, the more angry I became at Hoover, and I thought I'd better get out of there before I said something out of turn, because I have a very short fuse for Neanderthal. <laughs> 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 So you can see um, see here uh, the way um, the let me just try to get this down. Okay. Okay. You can see how um, the black press is presented um, throughout the film. It follows with this, and I don't think there's been another film that has done this. We. Um, I was speaking with Jerry Ann, and we were talking about, you know, what film we could use. There are no feature films, um, and this was the only documentary about the black press. And yet, we can see um, that the black press, from its inception, functioned as a democratic sphere, um, and its visionary leaders, uh, which included um, Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells, 
um, Robert um, Abbott, who very much intervened with, with the Great Migration and all of that, um, Charlotte Bass, that they were really um, what you would call public intellectuals, um, who, as described by Said, are exiled and unsettled visionary leaders who guide and help the communities critically um, articulate their fears, crises, and anxieties, um, as well as their hopes and dreams, and thereby provide alternative perspectives of history, as well as new stories. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sophia Songhai, and you are the first people on this earth to see this film. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's my first audience for this project. Um, I'm a graduate of Howard University Film School as well as NYU Film School, and I am a professor now at Plymouth State University, which is a little up the ways, a little farther north than we currently are, if that's even possible. Um, and. Um, <laughs> So I'm gonna read you the log line for the film and then I'm just gonna show you the film. So, you know, prepare yourself. I did wanna know if there's a way to come turn the lights off. Oh, that you're already there. You're wait. See, we're here, we're already here. Okay, all right. In 1978, a bronze skin bombshell rocked the world of Sunday morning football. Millions tuned in, but few know the story of the first African-American female sportscaster to demand her airtime on network television. Black, beautiful, and refusing to fumble, Jane Kennedy, she changed the game when she covered the game. <laughs> to be a co-anchor on the, the desk of the Super Bowl is like the crown jewel of broadcasting. Jane, uh, the fastest woman, uh, has one come across yet? Yes, Greta White's, and as a matter of fact, her time was a record, and she was one of those people that was the first at ever running a marathon distance. What a chauvinist I am. What a <laughs> four hours since this, of course we've had women come in. Of course, Listen, of course. Out in when I heard that, the, uh, that CBS was looking for a female to um, take the desk at the CBS NFL today to replace Phyllis George. First week results for three or more than 200 NFL rookies. I, I just said, you know, God, I, I'd love to do that job. I mean, it was like, to me, a dream come true. The new Miss America for 1971, Phyllis George, Miss Texas. How has it been being the first lady of the locker room and the first lady of Kentucky? Coming right at you on the NFL today. Barbara Walters was the pioneer in news broadcasting, and I became the pioneer in sports. I knew that I could do that job. So I asked my agent to submit me, and I said, you got to put me on. I know I can do this job. you got to put me on the list. And they refused. And they said, no, they're not looking for a black, and they're not looking for a non-journalist. And my parents always raised me to never doubt myself. If you want to do something, go for it. And if it doesn't work that way, figure out another way to do it. Intercepted in the end zone, badly underthrown receiver with the Rams, and the key attraction, the New York Giants. There's no question. It's changed so much. I haven't been in New York in almost 20 years. Oh, it's Central Park. Right? Yeah. Hey, see, I did recognize something. Three times they submitted a list of 10 people, and three times all 10 were rejected. I called the agency back, and they said they're not looking for an African American. So I said, okay, cool. <laughs> I'm just going on my own. And uh, so we ended up calling Jim Brown. There were a couple of people in professional football that did not want me to succeed. He said, okay, so you got to meet Bob Stenner. He's a field producer for the games. And he says, well, you got to meet George Wallach. He's um, Bruce Jenner's manager at this time. And um, so I called George Wallach, and he set up a meeting. I came in. He said, yeah, I think you'd be great on the job. He said, but I tell you what, if you get the job, I want to be your manager. And I said, OK. Once I walked into the studio and I saw what they were probably looking for, and it didn't look anything like me, 
because everybody that was doing the audition, they were all blonde. And I was the only one. I said, you know, I'm not going to get this job. They're not looking for a black. I'm not going to get this job. This is CBS. <laughs> I got to New York, I went on the audition, and um, Brent Musburger stood up and said, it's Jane or nobody, and he left the room. The director said, Jane or nobody. The producer said, Jane or nobody. They showed it to the uh, president of CBS Sports. He said, Jane or nobody. When the Dallas Cowboys well, arrived in New well, York late yesterday, they still didn't hire me, even though everybody said they wanted me, because putting me on the desk, meant that they would have an African-American, a Caucasian, and apparently Robert Newhouse was tipping the offensive and an African-American. Yesterday, CBS had a cassette of Tutal Jones's bout ready for them to view. And there was no way they were going to do that. And so they said, how can we get around the fact that we want Jane on the show, but we can't have two blocks on the show? We can't. Two blocks on the show. Ready record, for the record book of 29 consecutive losses in Chicago Cardinals Cardinal should Tram not be there. Having an African American woman on the set for the network was a problem because it was two blacks and one white. So that was what their fear was, you know. What, what if the Southern affiliates pulled out? I mean, the show would be dead. Jimmy was a, a loner, he was narcissistic, cantankerous. Off the top of his game, not as well connected as he once was. But they decided to get around the problem of two blacks and one white. They moved Jimmy the Greek to the desk. So it became a four person desk. So it was Jimmy, Irv, Brent, and me. So two blacks and two whites. And that's how they fixed the problem. Reporter from WRC TV was asking questions about Martin Luther King's birthday and the progress blacks have made in society. No, I don't want to. I don't want to. Okay. Okay. I let Jimmy speak for himself. He said that blacks were bred to be superior athletes. The slave owner would 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 breed his big black to his big woman, so that he could have a a big a big, a big black kids. And Snyder said that's why blacks excel over whites in sports. I I didn't know him that well. I only saw him on the set. To me, he was like an angry teddy bear. Nothing made it. Nothing made him happy. The black is a better athlete to begin with because he's been bred to be that way because of his high thighs and big thighs that goes up into his back. It goes without saying that his comments do not reflect in any way the thinking or attitude to the rest of us here at CBS Sports. And I remember the day that they called the telephone call. I picked it up and they said, um, "Welcome to the NFL today." And we just started yelling and screaming and jumping up and down and hugging each other. They, they didn't give me a year contract. They gave me a six-week contract uh, trial period. And I said, dang, I'm going to have to prove myself all over again. CBS Sports Spectacular wanted to be able to get some comments from Muhammad Ali. Keep your camera moving because I'm kind of there. And it wasn't happening. And so I heard all this bickering back and forth, and I said, I can get you an interview. And I called Ali, and I said, you know what? I have the opportunity to do this at CBS, and I got to get an interview with you. He said, sure. He said, I'll leave the key for you. He said, go to my suite immediately after the fight. He said, and I won't go to the ABC interviews. He said, I'll tell them that I need to rush by there, and we'll do a couple of things with you, a couple of minutes with you. Man, I'm so fast. Last night, I cut the light off in my bedroom, hit the switch, was in the bed before the room was gone. <laughs> He walked in the door and he still had his robe and his trunks on and his sweats pouring down and his tapes were still on his hands and he walked over to the camera and he punches into the lens. He said, I will only do this for my friend Jane. Control in New York, here's Brent Musburger. Good afternoon everyone and welcome back to the NFL Today. It's indeed my pleasure today to welcome the newest member of our NFL Today team, Jane Kennedy, who grew up cheering Jim Brown in Cleveland and now lives in Los Angeles wondering what's going on with the Rams. Jim Jane. would like to hear that. First of all, I wanted to thank everybody for just being friends on the show. I'm going to appreciate that a lot. Monday morning when I got home, I had, they had picked up my contract for the whole year. I knew that getting the job on the NFL Today would make the difference. I had no idea how big that difference was going to be. Jane was the first African-American co-host of CBS. Uh, the sports anchor. Uh, yep, sports yes. anchor. Of CBS NFL, NFL Today. Today. Right. Yes. 
She also has a lot of accomplishments that include an Emmy nomination for her work. I didn't appreciate that I was getting paid $40,000 for a job, to do a job that other people were getting paid in the upper hundreds of thousands, millions, and beyond. I didn't, the only thing that I could credit for that was because I was black. Upwards to three and five million. It's a shame, you know, the black woman, she's up there, first of all, as a black, she wasn't getting paid, and as a woman, she wasn't getting paid. $40,000 for the whole year for an Emmy Award winning show. My agent that refused to submit me three times, and I had to end up going in to get a manager, they decided that they, they were supposed to be do their percentage of my $40,000 contract. And so they sued me and they won. So I had to pay my manager, my agent that didn't do anything, a publicist, and Uncle Sam. So there wasn't very much left. You know, like if you, if you advocate for yourself, you know, and that's yourself, that's your gender, that's your race, or whatever your, your identity is, you know, advocate for yourself, but realize that there's a global um, group of people out there that need you to be their leader as well. When I think about how difficult it was and how challenging it was to just try to maintain your identity. Jane Kennedy in the mysterious island of beautiful women. In the movie, I, my hair is natural and it's, you know, full and everything. The day that we wrapped, the very next day, I had to fly to Puerto Rico to do the Pan Am Games. Today here at Guanabo Coliseum, mainly because the United I get a memo from CBS the very next day. Um, you cannot wear your hair on the, on the set that way. You need to do your hair. And we're still having that argument today. Black people can't wear their hair natural. And what's wrong with that? And so I knew that CBS had the contract to do the Super Bowl for uh, 1980, and I couldn't wait. And they said, we're going to put you up in a helicopter. And um, every time it got time for to throw to what was supposed to be my interview. Lady's new comedy, Heaven Can Wait, is chock full of magical moments. Hello. <laughs> they said, and now we're going to go to Phyllis George at the, um, the, I think it was the Gingerbread Restaurant. He's here at the Gingerbread in the heart of Beverly Hills. What a party, Phyllis. I tell you, we've had more fun. Of course, Carol Connors on the Splash Joe Namath, predicted Pittsburgh to win. Lonnie Anderson of WKRP with with us, uh, Tanya Tucker. With her husband. And of course, my husband. Uh, what a year he's had. He's had a super four year of his own. Well, I guess when you consider marrying Miss America and becoming governor of Kentucky and father child all in one year, we have had a super four year. I was the governor of Kentucky. had nothing to do with the NFL today. And I was just pissed. I jumped out of the helicopter and Irv Cross was right there. And he just grabbed me and he held me. He said, Jane, there's nothing you can do. He says, nothing you can do. And he said, just don't, just don't, don't go there angry. Uh, Let's like check now around and see how the fans. Let's go to the ginger man at Paul Horning. L.A. fans have to be happy, Paul. I want to say it was a couple months later, and a Western Union telegram comes for me, and it said, you're fired. Bob McNulty says to me, Jane, he said, I don't know what's going on, but we've been instructed to cut you out of the show as much as possible. He says, so I've been editing cue cards all week. And I go, oh my God. I, and I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know what I had done wrong. Um, my heart was broken. Do blondes really have more fun? CBS fired me uh, for breach of contract and that I was going to be working on a show for the NBC uh, network. Speak up, America! And uh, so I gave them the contract that Frank Smith had signed, and they hired me back. And then two weeks later, they fired me again. They're not those words that you use to demean them and to belittle them and to degrade them and to deny them their equal rights. I decided I was going to hire Gloria Allred, a uh, women's rights advocate uh, attorney. And uh, she was just beginning her career. So um, she stormed into CBS and demanded that they give me my job back. And um, they did. And they paid me the remainder of my contract. And then they fired me again. And that was it. Uh, fired three times within probably a month and a half. And uh, I was gone. 
Hi, I'm Jane Kennedy, your host for Greatest Sports Legends. And I'm Jane Kennedy, inviting you to join us for the 1981 Tournament of Roses Parade. Hi, I'm Jane Kennedy, and I want every one of you out there to love your body. So what the NFL today had done... I love sports. It just rocketed my career. But I'd much rather be a participator than a spectator. In 1984, I was hired to do a Jovan fragrance ad with Billy Dee Williams. Think sexy is an all-day job. Uh, Lee Horsley. We can't remember the blonde. I found that we were all paid the same. Welcome back to NBA Countdown. We're getting it was so hard to just try to prove that you were worth it. Game to game, you know, you haven't been sure if it was going to be that sore. For me to just try to prove that I was equal. Let's first take a look at Indiana. I wanted to get paid for doing the same job that everybody else. I wanted to get paid the same. All right. That yeah. would be a problem. I, I would totally understand. You do the same job. And be that leader amongst that. You get the same promotion. Leaders and two teams. And you get the same check. I, I recognize the impact that I had on their careers. They may not. Um, I don't get acknowledged for it, but that's OK. Um, but I, I know the struggle it took to take that first step. It's never easy to be a pioneer. It's never easy to be the first one. You can bend but never break me, cause it only serves to make me more determined to achieve my final goal. And I'll come back even stronger, not an office any longer, cause you deepen the conviction in my soul. for being out of sync. I'm not sure what happened with that, but. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm just gonna nice sit with that film. work for a minute. <laughs> All right, that was amazing. Oh, good. Okay. That was amazing. I am like so honored to be in the audience of the first okay. viewing of that film. Thank you. So, <laughs> yeah, we can. Yeah, that that took a lot. And and um, there's so many things I want to dig into there. Um, but before I get to the questions that I want to ask. Um, as you each reflect on the pieces you both just shared. Um, I'd love to hear a comment from each of you about the other, right? And, and what you see aligning and what you see departing. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. The heroicism. I will say that. It, it's amazing. Hmm. Very moving, yeah. She's, she's moved right now, so she's going <laughs> to. Yeah. I've just said, hero can you not hear me? Heroicism. Oh. Just bring her close. Okay, heroicism <laughs> and that kind of bravery to do all that and forge a new, forge a place within something that's already established and forge a new place. Right. And I think um, with Stanley, Nels Stanley Nelson's films, I was raised on them. Like they're they're everything to me. They you know they've given me everything about um, my understanding of this the continuation you know that that resides in all of us and so i feel like the ida b wells segment of the film um of, of everything stanley nelson does right but especially mm -hmm. when she meets it when she um uh, is confronted with a lynch mob i feel like jane kennedy went through that as well <laughs> in a different way and in a way that was much more sophisticated than just sort of this 
you know, um, corporate. Yes, <laughs> a corporate lynching. <laughs> and, uh, yes, and I mean, I didn't. When I called her up, I had no idea that she had gone through all that. I thought it was a big victory story. I was like, Oh, you were the first one. That's great. And she's like, Oh, let me tell you what happened. And I was like, It was a five-hour phone conversation. I was bawling throughout. I'm like, Then they did that to you? They did what? How could? I? Like the whole time. And then when I finally did the first edit, I was bawling at the credits. And I called her up and I'm like, I Just thank you for doing this because I'm an anchor woman as well. Everything that she went through, I've had some version of that especially the hair thing I've had that happens all the time and Ida B Wells is that first person who stood in front of the world and risked her life um, and I feel like Jane kicked the door in <laughs> I mean, like you know with stilettos on you know what I mean like that type of thing and I, I think those two women are so brave and they do it in a in a world that is um, very male world I mean Ida B yeah, Wells exactly. was defending men mm -hmm. Um, and Jane Kennedy was in the world, a male-dominated industry, and you know was already termed a beauty queen. And she had to go and say that, hey, you know, I have a brain, and I know how to. I also know I have a, I have a brain for football. <laughs> That's a big deal. So yeah. One of the things that struck me about um, Nelson's piece, I think it was early in. I took some notes, so pardon me. <clears throat> um, one of the interviewees says, we didn't try to be objective because we didn't see the white press being objective. We took a position. Um, I'm curious in each of your work um, how you see the position of the black press and black correspondence within that and, and how it shifts when black is taken off press. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Objective, okay. Well, I think it is important as a journalist to be objective. I've had to interview people that I don't, have anything in common with at all. Totally disagree with them, but I have to put that journalist hat on and see it from their side. And I've even had people call my news director and say, this is the best reporter we've ever had because they think I agree with them. I don't, but at the moment, they thought that I did. So I think it's very important to always remain objective. Uh, I do, however, recognize that you, ha you're, when you're black, your story is not told for such a long period of time. And as a journalist, you're a historian. That's really what you are. So, you know, it's that whole, when the rabbit's got the gun thing, right? Like, <laughs> it's like, this is your chance um, when you're the people who have been assailed to tell your story from your perspective. And like they said in your film as well, the idea that in the black press, which I was also raised on the Bay State banner, and, um, you know, every, I mean, every moment in my family's life has been documented by black press, you know, from Jet Magazine to Ebony and Essence and, you know, all, and BT and many other things, I feel like that's where you have to show the balanced side of the story. So it's not about not being objective, it's about giving this balance to the seesaw because yeah. oftentimes we are only portrayed as criminals. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Objective is a context. Mm -hmm. And um, today with representation, uh, you know, you hold up this sort of so-called objectivity and Toni Morrison has pointed out you know, if you're well-bred, you don't bring up the question of race. Mm -hmm. uh, you become generous and liberal, and you do that, and you overlook race, um, when actually it forms the very, I mean, she was talking about American literature. You know, it forms um, the basis of Amer a lot of American literature. Mm -hmm. And so this whole thing with objectivity can sometimes uh, be a norm, a standard that you're upholding. And so um, I think uh, uh, this balance, right. you need to realize when that objectivity is failing you. you there's certain things where you do want to be so-called objective, yeah. but there's no set standard. And who gets to say what's objective? Yeah. That's where I think the power representation comes into play. Who gets to say this is objective, that's biased? Right, right. Mm -hmm. In both films, um, and I'm thinking in Nelson's film about, um, is it Frank or Fred Bolin, who's the correspondent who's... Um, Frank, Frank, I think his name yeah. is Frank, Frank. Uh, Frank at one Bolin. point he shares that um, he knew he needed to leave before he spoke his mind. <laughs> um, and um, Jane describes the, the rage, I'm kind of thinking back to that first panel, the rage she felt recognizing that, mm -hmm. you know, her aerial uh, interview shot was being cut in favor of, you know, a shot at a bar with a Kentucky governor. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking about the black press, I'm thinking about black correspondence, and I'm thinking about rage, and, um, you know, kind of riffing off this idea of objectivity. How do you see that being navigated and um, and I'm curious from Jane's perspective if she shared with you whether she felt she navigated that effectively for herself or not. 
Sure. Um, so Jane Kennedy is also my cousin. She's my mom's first cousin. And so there was this legend of her and my family for so long. And, you know, we had these stacks of Jet magazines, and they were sacred. Like the Jane Kennedy Jet magazines are like, no, they're in like a glass box. You can't touch them, right? And so for a long time, even though she was in my family, I was used to seeing the smiling Jane Kennedy and like the beautiful Jane Kennedy, you know, all these things that were very superficial. And saw her at the family reunions and, you know, <laughs> corresponded with her very large family. But then when I was interviewing her, you know, it's, I wanted, after, after interviewing her, I wanted to explain what the toll that it takes on the person who decides to be the first. Because they're so um, insistent on showing the brave front because they know that no one else in their generation okay, is prepared to do what they're about to do. But what happens when they have, you know, that door closes and they are in their hotel room, in their house, whatever, and the weight of all of those body shots, right? You know, those kidney shots, those you know, shots to deliver, all those body shots that you can't see because they're hidden under your clothes, what happens? And so uh, she kept initially trying to explain, like, oh no, Sophia, we have to say that we were winners. We're winners, like, we always have to. I'm like, no, I don't want to show that you're a winner all the time. I want to show what it feels like to be inside of that. I want to see what that feels like. And so eventually, I actually had to interview her about several components several times, and like the part with the Jovan commercial where she finally you know, says that she was paid the same amount, we interviewed her about that like four times, and she's like, and then I was paid the same amount, and then eventually she was like, I was paid the same amount. Like, that's all I ever wanted was just to have my work, my experience, my you know presence to be validated in every way it can be on the same level. And that's and it was like she actually went off on that on her own towards the end of the interview. And it was like the weight of the day, you know, as you wear as you interview someone over time. They kind of like, you know, let it all hang out eventually, right? So, um, and she went from being a person who was always about the strong front to eventually showing me what I wanted, which was, what does that feel like to be the first? I mean, if you look at, say, like, Dr. King, you know, his autopsy, he has, all, he has the body of someone decades older than him, you know, because of the stress that he was under. Yeah. And I think, you know, we're very ready to validate um, the pain of other people, but other groups of people, but for black women, that's like a part of, that's, we're always applauded for that, and yet we have coronary artery issue, where, you know, our bodies are suffering. And, um, you know, Jane Kennedy has struggled with her weight after her, you know, uh, her earlier career, but I think that that's a reflection of, you know, how she was able to, for a moment while she was having her kids, finally deal with the emotional impact. Um, and so I was on the phone with her, and she said, she's, you know, Sophia, I don't, I don't like what I, what I look like right now. And I'm like, do you know what you look like to us? Do you know what you do for us? Like, you have no idea. Forget whatever you're looking at in the mirror. Like, you know what, what you feel inside of me as a woman? Like, I, I felt invincible every time I would go to the editing room after just hearing, you know, snippets that aren't even on this video. <laughs> like, there's so many components. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, you're like my new motivational speaker. I can't believe I slept on you all these years. You know, like, she's just incredible. And um, I think the, the anger and the rage she always held together. And it has a toll. And that's another part of the film I really want to, um, I want black women and women and people, period, but especially, especially black women to, you know, we, strong is, uh, <laughs> is definitely um, a compliment, but it can also be a way for people to dismiss you um, and your pain and say that your yeah, pain does strong. not, yeah, it's like, she do, you do it. we have shoulders to go to? <laughs> like, the shoulders we lean on, so. Yeah, I, I definitely saw that throughout. One of the fascinating um, parts of your film was, it, you know, they'd show her in such a happy way, mm -hmm. you know, always a winner. And, and that was one of the things with, yeah. especially television, you're presented as that, a winner, happy, mm -hmm. and you had no idea what's going on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And when you hear about what's going on behind the scenes, mm -hmm. it, makes you, it makes you angry that that they're not as happy as they should be, mm -hmm. and that, you know, with their smiles mm -hmm. and everything is perfect. Uh, and, you know, and that's one of the things about celebrityhood. Mm -hmm. I, I think that you know, and, and when you're in the press, and especially today with this celebrityhood, I think it becomes quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. you, pr you know, project that perfect life, and you know, now we're in um, Twitter, social media, Instagram, <laughs> everyone's doing these perfect, you know, I know. perfect vacations. Filters. <laughs> yeah. Doing, you know, doing their faces yeah. and mm -hmm. all this kind of, you know, where you're always perfect mm -hmm. and it's hiding everything. Mm -hmm. Both of these works mm -hmm. really, um, reveal the line that black press and black correspondents are navigating, um, around and through whiteness. And so, uh, in each of the stories, there's 
a, a moment of permission being granted, of a, a gate not being closed um, because of the intervention or the intercession of a white individual. And so I'm wondering if each of you might speak to um, how that makes you think about the work of journalism and of bl the black press um, and the resilience that it shows in and around that kind of white mm. gatekeeping. Well, I think one of the most important parts about the Jane Kennedy film is that they were prepared for a Barbara Walters and a Phyllis George, right? America was ready for that, but no one even invited, and didn't even, would refuse to let her audition, just refuse to let her audition. She's paying them. They get a percentage of everything that she makes, and they refuse to send her off to this audition on the sole basis that she's black. And so I feel like that you know, component always that always said something to me that when people are like, well, is it the time? I think they mentioned that in your film as well. It's like, you know, this isn't the time yet. And it's like, well, how long is it going to be before, you know, I'm on AARP, the cover of AARP magazine. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, like, and so it's always this idea of, um, do, you know, Dr. King's Why We Can't Wait. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. That's why that title is so important. And it's like you have to decide that change is inevitable, one, but I'm not going to be at the mercy of it or I'm not going to be at the helm of it. And Jane decided she was going to be at the helm of that change and she was going to usher it in. Um, and she was like a black exploitation actress. You know, that's where, that was the level of power that she had in 1976. She had the Miss Ohio, uh, Miss, uh, yeah, Miss Ohio USA win, first black woman to win that, and that was like eight years before. So, you know, she wasn't coming from this big lofty position of power. And, and um, I remember I was reading some article, and underneath her picture, to, you know, to reduce her, her um, new job, they said, Jane Kennedy likes pancakes. And that's like what they said underneath her caption to just make it seem like she was more of just like a bubblehead. So she had to constantly fight, fight, fight to explain to people that, no, I know the game. And one year, the year before this Super Bowl, she predict, she was the only uh, sportscaster to predict the team that was going to win. Everyone else was going, I think it was for the Steelers. And she said it was the Buccaneers, and the Buccaneers won. And they held a parade in her honor. That's in the longer version of the film. But they held a parade in her honor because she was the only sportscaster to predict that. So, <laughs> you know, that's the thing about it, is that people are oftentimes ready for um, sometimes a black man or a white woman before a black woman. That's kind of like, whoa, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, wait, whoa, whoa, <laughs> you know, like, let's not get ahead of ourselves. And she was like, but I'm already here. <laughs> catch up, catch yeah. up. Uh, what was fascinating with um, Nelson's um, documentary is that, um, especially towards the end with, in the demise, um, how the civil rights movement itself brought up the demise of the black press, um, precisely because then white presses started hiring mm -hmm. um, black photographers, black journalists, um, and um, uh, um, other other um, uh, black workers, mm -hmm. and it created and you know and also even black press then um, bigger um, ads such as GM or Ford started advertising with, um, with them. And they had to then cut down and couldn't say what they really wanted to say. They couldn't be radical. Mm -hmm. And so something was lost. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think, you know, uh, one of those things, um, and this is why I love um, Edward Said when he talks about, he says the public intellectual has to be outside an exile. And pr it's precisely at that moment when they um, moved into um, uh, and became part of with the white press that they lost, you know, they, they lost that, that, um, that radical mm -hmm. element mm -hmm. that was there. And so to battle that, that's a whole different, um, a whole different, uh, you know, can of worms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here in that last answer, we're navigating between that first panel and thinking through, um, you know, media ad buys, right? And who, who gets to say what, where, and who has influence over the page. I wanna open up um, for questions, I know that we have some rotating, roving microphones available, so um, questions that the audience may have. Good afternoon. Thank you both so very much for your presentations. Um, particularly with the Jane Kennedy film, I, I love sports, and I noticed today that particularly with the NBA and the NFL, the female sportscasters, and people can wear whatever type of clothing they want to wear, but I noticed that the female sportscasters show a lot more skin than the male sportscasters. And I think about body imaging 
and so forth. What, you know, could you give some insight on that? Because with Jane Kennedy, it seemed as if, seemed as if, as if she was clothed, you know, just in yeah. a normal, quote unquote, normal way, mm -hmm. along with the male casters. But what about today's time and, and the dress and, and, and the way sure. that some of the female sports casters are dressed? Well, I mean, you know, most people who watch ESPN and, you know, Sports Center and all, they're, they're guys. So, you know, it's an entertainment um, field. I know with Jane, when she was a sportscaster, she often wore pants. That's, it was so hard to get her into anything that wasn't like the most comfortable thing. I'm like, you cannot wear like sweatpants to this interview. Like, you cannot be that comfortable. She's like, but I'm just playing Jane, Sophia. I'm just playing Jane. I'm like, no, come on. We got to dress you up. We got to be glamorous. She's like, no, we're talking about sports. We're talking about sports, Sophia, okay? Like, we're not talking about glamour. I'm like, okay, all right, well, we're going to get you into something. That's, but that's her personality. And she really is like, she was raised in sports. She played everything you can imagine. She was track and field. She played basketball. Like, she was, she is a proper athlete. And so I think a lot of women who, become sportscasters now, you know, they are people who come from a lot of times a sports background and they have to get media training, you know, to learn how to be sportscasters because their natural instinct is to be an athlete. And so, yeah, I mean, one of the fastest ways to get a woman, you know, ready for television is to have her look like, you know, the, um, at least eye candy, as an anchor woman, that's a big part. They, they don't genuinely care as much about what you know as much as what as uh, what you look like. So um, they do care about what you know right afterwards, <laughs> but first is what you look like. So I think that's just kind of come along. It's just a part of the business in the sense that you're on TV, you're getting paid to be on TV. You know, you need to, you need to, you know, be appealing. Um, even the guys have to be appealing. Like we spray their hair with like a balding, you know, the men's balding, but we have like hairspray for that. There's all kinds of tricks. Like they wear makeup too. So I don't think they're getting away with anything. Even guys have to be shiny and polished on television. So um, I don't really find it to be a problem, but I think the sports casters are similar to weather, you know, weather casters as well as anchor women. We just kind of wear jewel colors, uh, sheath dresses. <laughs> it's like our uniforms. So um, my closet's filled with them, trust me. It's like a normal thing. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, uh, one here and then Dennis up here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm just curious. I may have missed it, but what were the reasons CBS gave <clears throat> to Jane uh, for firing her sure. repeatedly? Sure. So Jane Kennedy got um, an opportunity to work on a show called Speak Up America on NBC, and she went to the head of CBS and said, hey, can I work both shows? And he said, that's fine. She's like, can I get that in writing? Oh, sorry. Can I get that in writing? I think this is right. Sounding a little echoey. Um, that was smart of her. Yes, and so, <laughs> but they didn't know that. So when they fired, they were looking for a reason to get rid of her to bring Phyllis George back. That was the real reason, right? So they were just clamoring, trying to figure out something to you know, pin it on. And so she already had clearance to work on Speak Up America. However, they wanted to bring Phyllis George back because her husband, the governor of Kentucky, um, would then give them, hopefully, the opportunity to do the Kentucky Derby. So they wanted to bring her back so that they could get the benefit of her husband's you know, new governor position, and they needed Jane gone. And so they just made up a reason trying to blame it on her, uh, you know, uh, vintage gaslighting. And, um, <laughs> and then at the end of that day, she ended up not really being a fireable person. That's why she was hired and fired three separate times. And when Gloria already got the remainder of her contract, it was like $2,000. So, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was essentially an internship. They were giving her this, you know, mildly, moderately paid internship and everyone else is getting paid the equivalent of millions of dollars or a million dollars in 1978 money. <laughs> so, yeah. And Phyllis George and Irv Cross were getting paid 300,000 while Jane was getting paid 40, minus, minus, minus to 16,000. All yeah. right, yes, thank you. <laughs> Objective. Yeah, no, that made me cry. Uh, I've noticed that um, the PBS NewsHour has a really good representation of races and backgrounds in their anchors and mm -hmm. in their reporter essayists. Um, CNN, I think, is ahead of MSNBC <laughs> in terms of panels that always, always, always have um, people who are not white on them. Uh, and but. For anchors of these shows, it's less, I mean, they have them from the weekend, but not during the weekdays. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, on the local broadcasts, I watch Boston TV, because I live in Exeter, uh, mm -hmm. it's still white anchors and black sports people. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I wonder if you have any comment about how that's going because I also regret that in this country we now have black channels and white channels mm -hmm. where blacks have token roles on the programs mm -hmm. and black channels where whites get to be the villain in a lot of shows and that's probably fair but you know it's I think we need to do better than that and in in uh, the United Kingdom they really are mixing it up to yeah. a point where as an American I go how could this be a little town with a black pub owner and all this stuff and the, they've adopted a policy of yeah, they're, they're it doesn't matter mixed. if it makes sense mm -hmm. just show it show it show it mm -hmm. and it'll become acceptable mm -hmm. <laughs> well I'm uh, more in cinema, and so I can kind of add, there, there is a rule, an unspoken rule. Um, it's starting to be broken, but the unspoken rule is the rule of three. And um, the rule of three is that if there are more than three black people in the film, in um, lead roles, it becomes a black film. And therefore, it won't attract mainstream. Mm -hmm. and it means niche market. And so, you know, um, this is why um, you have Denzel Washington, and he's surrounded with whites. Samuel L. surrounded by whites. Um, uh, um, Will Smith, Smith yeah. surrounded by whites. Eddie Murphy surrounded by whites. And so, you know, this is the, um, that's the rule. It is starting to um, to be broken slowly, but you know, you don't know if that's going to continue. Uh, think of um, Ryan Coogler's films. Um, they are, uh, you know, he doesn't have that rule of three. Um, Fruitvale Station, uh, and then of course um, Apollo Creed, uh, which has, you know, Sly Stallone is in it, but still nevertheless it has, uh, you know, other people. Um, and um, of course Black Panther, which is has now sold over a bill as uh, over a billion um, profit, uh, you know, around the world, mm -hmm. and so that is, uh, you know, it's being broken. And you think of films like Moonlight, um, even Hidden Figures, mm -hmm. uh, films like that. Uh, they're starting to change. Um, Aubrey Duvernay's films, uh, they're starting to change. But you know we don't know where it goes. But there is that rule of three, and when you look, uh, you know it's fascinating. Um, uh, Samuel L. Jackson is in the book, the Guinness Book of World Records, as being the richest man for the. Um, I think he's been eclipsed recently, um, but uh, um, for about ten years he led the pack, made much, much more than Brad Pitt, and that is fascinating. But look at how he's presented in his films. He's alone. Uh, and if you have like a big film like Independence Day with Will Smith, mm -hmm. they tend, and he has a, um, what does he have in there? Um, a, a girlfriend mm -hmm. who is a stripper. <laughs> Yeah, Vivica uh, Fox, yeah. yeah. A stripper, uh, you know, and he's an Air Force captain mm -hmm. and was, right. was going to save the world. But she's a stripper, and they, they make the family look dysfunctional mm -hmm. um, and um, lessen that family. Mm -hmm. So. And I think building up what you're saying, it's it's not even just about having a black face. It's about the depiction of that black face. And mm -hmm. so whether that is in film or it's also in television news, a lot of times, you know, that's where you're going to end up with tokenism because they're just like, you're a black face. Come on up, black face, and just be a black face yeah. and talk and say the things that we need you to say. Um, because where there's still the people who are the marionettes, um, you know, the puppet masters rather, and you're the you know you're the puppet. So it's um, I think most black people have experienced that the. The issue with doing things that you know, black companies versus white companies, it's we have the same story over and over again because it's just very difficult to be um, a token, and you you know end up all the things you want to say, you you type that email, and then you delete it, <laughs> you know, like right before you send it out. So I definitely think that in television news, I know when I worked at a TV station in Missouri, I was doing a, I was the only black woman in the whole building, and I remember I covered stories about black people, and they said, you know, they only let one work there at a time. That's exactly what he said. And my news director, she was like, you know, you, just, you look just like Holly Berry. You just look just like, I'm like, I don't. Like, I'm like Holly Berry, but thank you so much. And she was like, well, you know, I just think Holly Berry, she, she's a pretty African-American woman. Like she just, and that was it. It was like, if you couldn't hit the Holly Berry standard, you will never be hired at this TV station. And I started going through tapes at the station where I worked and every, every woman who worked there before me looked just like me, identical to me. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I mean, it was, it was some kind of horror film where I was looking at all the possible people who could play me. I'm like, oh, oh, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I mean, she had in her mind the standard for a black woman. She was, you know, color. She is a white woman, but she was color struck. And you know, the only the level of black that you had to be could not pass a certain level of, you know, butterscotch or whatever. You know, you want to call this the situation I'm working with in the middle of November, New Hampshire. Um, and, you know, so. Um, and I think the same thing, I think it's also important with Jane's film is the idea that Jane, you know, I, I remember telling the hairdresser, I'm like, I really need her hair to be natural. Like I need her to have the, you know, poofy. she straightened the heck out there. I was like, ah, oh, like, you know, what are you doing? You know, and so I thought at the end, I was really upset because she didn't have natural hair, but really I was glad in the end because a lot of times people think that very fair-skinned black people don't experience this, and that's not a part of their, you know, a part of their experience um, of being of facing racism. They they're let into the door perhaps earlier, but they're left in the vestibule, in the cold vestibule, right? And so it's a, an experience a lot of people don't get. And they and, and actually Oprah, there's a clip where Oprah says to Jane or says about Jane, she's on the show and she's like, well, you remember Jane Kennedy? You know, you had to look like Jane Kennedy to be on TV. And she's she's talking about how Jane must have had this easy breezy life in broadcasting. Little does she know that while Oprah was in Baltimore on People Are Talking and fighting her fight with, you know, relaxers that pulled her hair out and then reducing her to a talk show instead of being a lead anchor, Jane was going through her own fight. On yeah. either end of the color spectrum, they were both battling the same monster who recognized that, you know, they created the one drop rule. And that rule governed all of us on the federal Supreme Court basis, not just in his personal interactions, in an in a institutionalized racism model that Europe doesn't have. And that's the difference between when you see black people in Europe in television versus in America, because we're still dealing with Plessy versus Ferguson, Jim Crow, and the people who were born yeah. in both your documentary and my documentary were born when that rule was spelled out very clearly, 3% of African-American ancestry makes you black in Virginia. Uh, any discernible, recognized, they had it all spelled out in legal terms. This is not Jethro and his pickup truck. This is the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, you know, you dropped a bomb on me is Black Wall Street, you know, Oklahoma, um, Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's not uh, outside terrorist. That's the United States government. So we're really dealing with, we need like 100 years after 1968 to fix any of that. And Europe never had an institutionalized racism model that governed you from in utero to the cradle to the grave, to the afterlife, okay? You know, like they tried to govern yeah. every aspect of your mind, body, and spirit, and that's gonna be pervasive in all industries, including broadcasting. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. Uh, thank you both. Uh, both of those films are absolutely amazing. Um, I wanted to thank you, first and foremost, for um, bringing Jane to light for me. Um, I'm a huge sports fan. I, I have no idea who she was um, oh, no. before today. So, <laughs> and I, and I, I genuinely like can't imagine watching sports without like Josina Anderson right. or Jamel Hill. Um, but thinking of that, mm -hmm. that um, kind of ties back to, to, to the film you showed. Mm -hmm. um, Jamel Hill has been treated some kind of way mm -hmm. um, time and time again. And I'm, I'm waiting for the next installment where this ties you know, um, to the Jamel Hill yeah. documentary, and we talk, we unpack all of that because I think You're right. that that's a huge problem because it, it's it's it mm -hmm. is directly tied to the history outlined in your film. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate you for highlighting that. Thank you. Um, yeah, and she said she would be in our documentary as well. So that's the the feature length will be a big section of Jamel Hill. Yes, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so, but my question with that is, um, the reason the reaction came out with Jamel Hill. Her comments on air at one point, mm -hmm. also tw uh, Twitter or wherever it was, social media. Um, the reaction's a result of her being on ESPN, which is a network, I assume, I actually don't know, but I assume is run <laughs> predominantly by, yeah. by white men. Most um, likely, yeah. <laughs> so my question is, is it important today hmm. to maintain um, some sort of like separate media you know, mm. a black media, the way, mm. the way that, um, you know, the, the first film portrayed. And, mm. and, and not, I, I think that objectivity is, is a part of the reason, but also just like reception, intention, cultural uh, uh, context, mm -hmm. I think all comes into play um, when we're thinking about these things. So I, I'm just curious, do you think it's important that we, that, that there is a black media, you know, a media for each segment of our populations? Or is the ideal that we all come to one media that we all agree on and, and somehow? Uh, <laughs> maybe, not politi maybe not politically, maybe not politically, but in some way, 
you know, as Americans? Well, I certainly think that, I think any, I, I really don't think in terms of like black and white, I think in more in terms of ideology. So there's lots of people who have high concentrations of melanin but still support white supremacy. And then there's, you know, people. <laughs> Right, very true. And then there's lots of people who should not step out in the sun because um, they will immediately burn who are definitely, um, who've been riders since the jump, you know? So it's like there's, I, I don't correlate people's mind or philosophy with their biological, you know, presentation on this earth. They had nothing to do with that. They have everything to do with the way that they think. Um, and that has been evident in Ida B. Wells' time and Frederick Douglass's time. I love Frederick, like Frederick Douglass is, oh my goodness. I just read his books like for a whole year, right back to back. And the one of the reasons is because it's dealing with the psychology, right, of what happens to people when you're in that position and what you do about it. So I always think that, you know, we create, African Americans, we created our tribes not because of our skin color or because of where we fell in terms of other people's identification of us, but because of what we did about it. Right? Like, what do you do when you're in a situation? That's your, that's your group, like the way that you react to being held hostage, the way that you react psychologically, the way that you react in terms of your, um, the, the next move that you make. And so, you know, when you read like Frederick Douglass's work, everything he says is applicable to right now. There's not one thing I can't apply to my, my Monday morning right? when I go back to work and, and battle the battles I have to um, fight. So, I mean, I think that, you know, to answer your question, when you are, um, you know, an African American person, it is always important to preserve your voice, and that can't be done when you are underneath someone else's thumb, no matter who that is. And no matter, you know, and no. so we have so many outlets now. There's new, it's, it's endless outlets to have your voice heard and, you know, to have your opinion, your perspective seen. So that's, that's why I went into film. I remember thinking, oh, I should be an actress. And I was like, for what? I'm just going to be someone else's, I, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to act out someone else's vision. I was like, I want my vision and my perception to be um, something that's marketable. And that's, that's how I ended up in so much student loan debt. But that's exactly why. <laughs> I think it's very important for you to decide not just about we need black skinned press, we need black conscious press. We need consciousness. That's what, of everything else, there's only three ways you can be black, right? Either you have significant amounts of African sub, uh, ancestry from sub-Saharan Africa, right? That's one way. Um, another way is that people will see you as such, and then they will treat you accordingly in a world where they um, attack people violently in a, in a violent manner because of their perception that you're black. But the third most important one is a black consciousness. That's the one that really matters the most. In ter I mean, Colin Kaepernick could be a man who is, recognizes himself as biracial, he could recognize himself, if he wanted to, as a white man who could pass and you know, cut his hair off and not have cornrows. He can also see himself as a black man. None of those things really mean anything until he decides to make a stand against black people who are not in a position that he's in to say something against police brutality, okay? And he could have said that as a white man, a black man, or a biracial man. It's not about any of those identifiers. It's about his action. His action is what proves his consciousness. And you know, that goes back to Malcolm X and Dr. King. You know, it's about someone's conscious behavior. It's that, that's what you judge them on. And that's all that really matters. So I would rather see media that's about the consciousness than just the idea of a color being, and then us being a monolith, which we'll never be. <laughs> right? So, yeah. Yeah. I think you need both. <laughs> Um, you know, multiple, um, um, you need black press, mm -hmm. but you also, mm -hmm. you know, you want that where you want to impact the mainstream press mm -hmm. and also um, have your space in there too. So I think, you know, you try to have both, but, you know, it, it's, a diff uh, mm -hmm. it's difficult. So I think we have one more question, and it's over here. Thank uh, you. I want to thank you for uh, <coughs> the presentations. Mm -hmm. Uh, showing a balance, um, I think uh, they're always, until the American character has changed to where mm -hmm. deeds, not words, be people's adorning, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you're going to need this for balance, whether it's right. women, any mm -hmm. people of color, because our history has not been good. Mm -hmm. People come from one continent to a continent of color and do things. Mm -hmm. But in my experience, um, almost 87 years on earth, right. is that the, the black press has been not only necessary for I informing people, because many white people have read the, paper, the, the right. press, the, whether it's the mm -hmm. Chicago Defender, the Baltimore Afro-American, we used mm -hmm. to get all of them delivered to our house, mm -hmm. delivered. Mm -hmm. I grew up in South Bend, Indiana. Mm -hmm. and, but I think it was something to really let people of color know 
You are somebody, you are worthwhile, you have a history. And during the bicentennial, it was the black press that came out and talked about how blacks were very important in the founding of this country and after 200 years in showing that wig makers, the, it, most of the barbers, everybody yeah. was, was black in this country. But I think the most important thing is that during that bicentennial year in 1976, mm -hmm. they showed, thanks to the black press calling to attention, historians verified that the overwhelming majority of people of African descent could place their presence in this country prior to 1776, mm -hmm. and the overwhelming majority of European Americans could not. Yeah. So in this present day, when they talk about who is American and who should go back where, <laughs> then I think, yeah. and ask the Indian nations of America mm -hmm. what they think about who yeah. should go back where. Exactly. <laughs> Yep. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to close us out with any thoughts? <laughs> uh, I'm, I really loved your film. I, I, I loved it. Uh, with Jane Kennedy there, and, you know, and, and it brought back all those things from the 70s yes. and 80s, how happy people looked on, <laughs> you know, where they all looked like winners and they were so perfect. <laughs> And, and you know, and seeing that, and then mm -hmm. juxtaposing it with her story, mm -hmm. and that she's telling it to you, I loved it. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was great. Well, I definitely would love to know what you all think. This is still a work in progress, so if there's any part of the story that's unclear, please let me know, because I can always go back to um, the editing room and rearrange that. So I hope to make a feature version of this and have it on a place like Netflix or Amazon Prime or um, Hulu, mm -hmm. and um, there's much more. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you both very much. Thank you for your questions. All right, let's give it one more hand of hand, hand clap. So this officially closed our panels for the day. Thank you to everyone who's attended. Um, I do have the pleasure of being able to tell you that you have to leave this room. Um, we need to get it ready for the dinner that's happening at 6 p.m. If you're coming back for the dinner, you can start check-in at 5.30 p.m. The doors will not officially open until 6 p.m. So you do have a little bit of time. I also forgot to give you the Wi-Fi password for anyone sticking around. Okay, so if you want the Wi-Fi password, it is Exeter47. So E-X-E-T-E-R 47. Um, and it's a capital E, so Exeter47. Um, Thank you, and please, if you can get out quickly, that would be great.